and this. Sorry, but as, uh, Kevin just reminded me that we normally record the seminars and um, our uh, administrative coordinator is not here, so I just turned it on. Um, is that okay? Do you mind us recording or? No, no, not at all. Go ahead. Yeah, sure. Okay, sorry. Yeah. Normally she asks you and uh, it's all done. Yeah, uh, sure, sure. Okay, Absolutely. sorry for interrupting. No, no worries. So, um, so I was I was just talking about the uh, uniqueness the uniqueness of maximally inscribed this. So, uh, uniqueness of mass maximally inscribed this is defined as the fractional area of the maximally inscribed disk that does not overlap with that of uh, skeletal point of any other branches. So, what do I mean? Um, so, let's just say uh, I'm looking at this. Uh, I'm looking at this disk. Uh, here uh, at point C1. And then I want to assign a uniqueness measure to this uh, point here. Now, I will look at how much of the area of this disk is not overlapping, or in other words, is unique uh, with any other disks from other branches, all right? So this disk here is not overlapping with any other disks of the medial axis from other branches. So this gets, a uh, this gets a value of one being completely unique. And then uh, as we get closer to the branch point, uh, the uh, values get uh, lower because like, for example, a disk at C2, we see a portion of disk at C2 is overlapping with another disk, which is at this junction point. And therefore, this gets a fraction of one. So uh, what's happening here? We are assigning a score of salience to all of our uh, skeletal points. Now, uh, we can basically threshold this. Um, uh, we can basically threshold all the skeletal points based upon uh, a particular threshold, and then keep those who are above the threshold and remove the rest. Now we have, um, with this, we can basically do uh, a ligature analysis and uh, create, a, a, you know, create a simplified version of the skeleton. All right, now let's just imagine we do this. We, uh, what we can do next is that we can associate the remaining of each skeletal segment from the previous slide with some node attributes and using the topology of the original skeleton, uh, we can have an abstract representation in form of a graph. So we call this graph to uh, be represented by flux graphs. So edges are directed based on the magnitude of the average maximal inscribed uh, disk radius. All right. Uh, now that I have my tool in place, uh, the first problem that I aimed to uh, was the problem of dividing the view sphere into regions in which views uh, that have qualitatively similar part of structures are grouped to uh, be in the same uh, cluster. So to get a better sense, let's just imagine that I'm looking at this view sphere around this 3, uh, 3D model of a dog. And I am assuming two paths on this view sphere. The first path that goes through points one, two, three, four, and five. And the second path goes from point six, seven, eight, nine, and 10. And I'm showing the views corresponding to these points on the view sphere. As we can see, the part structures in the first path is changing a lot um, for this particular 3D shape but the part of structures in the second path is not changing that much. Now, the question is, can we use flux graphs uh, to basically group those views that are similar to each other? All right, so this is what we do. This is what we did. So um, silos that have similar part of structures uh, we know that they, they can they can be grouped into the same cluster. So to the to address the view sphere partitioning problem, we created a dense view sphere and we consider each view on this view sphere to uh, represent a node of another graph. 
uh, where we use for clustering. So each node in this graph is connected to another node by an edge, which is weighted based upon the similarity between those views. And um, we, this way we can create a similarity matrix. We then implemented a hierarchical clustering algorithm that uh, divided uh, this graph into smaller clusters until we get to a cluster that we have a high within similarity, uh, good high enough, like you know, high enough within uh, similarity within all the views of those clusters. So, for example, let's just say if I want to break this uh, view sphere around this dog model into six clusters, all right. Uh, let's just take a look at like you know the first cluster. The um, the more transparent one here is just representing. Uh, the cluster from the other side of this dog model. Like basically this is the closer uh, region and this is like the other region. And remember that here we are considering just the silhouettes of the objects. So we see like somehow a symmetric uh, relationship between these clusters. Like, you know, we have clusters on either, either side of the 3D model. Now uh, we pick some sample views from the first cluster and depicted here. And then we pick some sample views from the second cluster, third cluster, and so on. And as you can see, the views in each cluster are very similar to each other. All right, so we have a way to do uh, view sphere partitioning. What can, we, what can we do with it? All right, so having clusters that include views with the similar part of structures, uh, what we can do is that we can verify whether this view sphere partitioning algorithm can uh, be beneficial to recognition tasks. So we tried uh, an experiment where we had two data sets of 3D models. Uh, the first one is the uh, 19 object models in the Toronto database. And the, the second one was McGill 3D shape benchmark, which included 150 models uh, with uh, 15 categories. Now, what we did was we um, tried a strategy of sampling views and making them be the representative of those 3D models. So we sampled eight views from these 3D uh, models and then said this eight samples are going to be the representative views of this 3D model. And we tried two different strategies here. The first strategy was to pick the centroid of each of these clusters as the candidate views. So the centroid is defined as the view which is most similar to all the other views within a cluster. And then we tried another sampling strategy, which was basically to pick random uh, views from, uh, from the view sphere. All right. Now, then we did a recognition task with different shape measures, uh, including shape context, inner distance, uh, shock graph, and flux graph. And uh, we tried uh, these recognition tasks with these two strategies of uh, sampling views. And we always see that sampling from uh, the centroid of clusters uh, do much better in, in terms of performance over the, over the random sampling from the view sphere. So, we uh, resulted that the canonical views help recognition task uh, performance. All right. Now, in the second part of my presentation, I want to talk about uh, grouping principles. So at this point of my studies, after the second year of my PhD, we started a collaboration with a group at U of T, which I'm part of right now. We learned that this group, my current group now, is very interested in the problem of understanding uh, the perception mechanism of natural scenes by a human brain. So this led us to start a collaboration that is still ongoing. So here we focused on a couple of fundamental uh, questions we were facing. So uh, the first question was, what are the principles of the visual perception? The second question was, how can we compute them? And the third question was, how can we evaluate these cues? So this was a great starting point for me to learn more about uh, perception and perceptual grouping cues. And obviously, we started working with classical principles of the Gestalt theory of 
visual perception. So as many of you know, Gestalt principles are principles uh, of human vision, uh, human perception that describe um, how human group similar elements uh, recognize patterns uh, or simplify complex images when we perceive objects. So designers use these uh, cues to organize contents on websites and other in, uh, interfaces. So it's aesthetically uh, more plausible and uh, like, you know, easier to understand. So what are these cues? Um, so uh, we, like we tried to uh, basically touch on five cues here. The first cue was uh, proximity. Proximity means uh, we group closer together elements. The second cue uh, was symmetry, which states that elements that are symmetrical to each other tend to be uh, perceived uh, as a unified group. Uh, the second cue is a continuation, which states that elements that are arranged on a line or on a curve perceive to be related uh, than the elements that are not on a line or a curve. And the fourth cue uh, is uh, a closure, uh, which means uh, that we look at the complex arrangement of visual elements. We try to, um, we tend to recognize those uh, that make a closed pattern. And the final uh, principle that we try to touch on was uh, the Gestalt grouping principle of uh, similarity, which says elements that are similar are perceived uh, to be more related than the elements that are not similar to each other. So uh, my starting point was to explore uh, the role of medial access in perceptual grouping for scene categorization problem. And uh, we know from Gestalt grouping principles that uh, the, the proximity, parallelism, and symmetry uh, play an important role in, in, in this problem, specifically symmetry is believed to support visual uh, perception by adding the visual system in uh, grouping fragments of uh, the um, grouping fragments of the bounding objects. So um, we try to uh, look at the role of symmetry here. We try to look uh, to look at the role of uh, symmetry in um, perception of uh, the, in, the, in the perception of uh, uh, scenes uh, by human. All right. So uh, in the continuum, I will uh, present novel tools that are based upon our average order of flux of skeletons. Uh, and we try to compute uh, these measures using uh, our medial representations um, for the line drawings of natural seas. All right. So in this line of work, we, ha we have examined the role of perceptual grouping cues in human recognition of line drawings of seas. So using uh, a measure of Gestalt grouping Q that I mentioned earlier, we created 50-50% splits uh, of that Q that contain parts of the contour pixels in each image in our constraint database. So uh, when we did this, uh, we had human observers uh, who were asked to categorize this stimuli in a controlled experiment. So the input was either the intact line drawing or the a stimuli with the top 50% of that queue or the bottom 50% of that queue in like each of these splits. And these were shown for a very short period of time, just 53 milliseconds, and then it was followed by a perceptual mask. So this basically made the whole task um, more difficult for the observers. So here I'm just showing you an example of an intact line drawing. Here we see the same line drawing with only the top 50% contour pixels retained. Uh, specifically, we are focusing on the local symmetry uh, as a cue here. Again, I'm showing you the same intact line drawing, but now I'm showing you the bottom 50% of the uh, symmetric contents in the image. All right, so we just go back one more time. So intact, symmetric, intact, and asymmetric. All right. In human experiments, we use the line drawings of 475 uh, color photographs of the six um, real world, six categories of uh, real world scenes. 
um, beaches, uh, forests, mountains, city, for, uh, city streets, uh, highways, and offices. And interestingly, we see that the results show, oh, like, you know, uh, the results from uh, behavioral, uh, like, you know, from human subjects show that uh, humans do a little bit over 13% better on the symmetric uh, condition than the asymmetric ones. Um, and obviously they do best on the intact line drawings, which is uh, shown in the left bar here. So um, like that, that was one of the like very first um, cool things we saw about, uh, you know, competing these uh, grouping cues. So, now uh, we move on to a new set of experiments that's uh, to understand how machines would perform uh, in a similar situation. Uh, we asked the question, uh, do perceptually motivated line drawing based importance measures also aid scene categorization in machine vision? So we wanted to see whether machines would benefit from the similar cues. So the previous set of experiments we, uh, we had involved uh, human subjects, and that was limited in the number of scenes. Uh, we had just 475 images in six categories. And here we wanted to scale up. We scaled up to two bigger data sets, MIT 67 with 6,700 images uh, in 67 categories and places 365 with 1.8 million images and 365 categories. Obviously, we didn't have uh, you know, artists to draw these number of uh, line drawings for us. So we had to be creative and innovative to generate line drawings from these uh, images on, us, on our own. So before I move on to the, um, machine, exper like, you know, uh, to the machine experiments, let me explain how we compute a measure of salience of contour pixels in a line drawing. So we begin with a natural scene and the line drawing uh, that's derived from that uh, natural scene. So this line drawing can be extracted either by a machine generated algorithm or it can be drawn by an artist. So what we do next is that we then compute the medial axis transform, uh, the AOF skeletons that I mentioned uh, in the beginning of my talk for each region within that line drawing. Then we have the medial axis we score all the skeletal points by one of the uh, measures of a Gestalt group in Q. And then uh, the, uh, like, you know, when we have these scores on the medial axis, we map them back all to the uh, boundaries uh, of uh, the, the line drawings of that uh, C. So this is how we basically uh, score all the points on the line drawings based on based upon one of those uh, grouping cues and then later we can just feed them to uh, a neural network um, as uh, the inputs uh, of to each of those uh, channels all right so this is how we basically compute uh, these medial axis based importance of scores all right so uh, what scores do we compute here uh, so the first score, as you can see here, is related to uh, parallelism. So owing to um, the continuous mapping between uh, the medial axis and scene contours, the medial axis provides a convenient representation for designing and computing these cues. Uh, it allows us to look at the uh, behavior of the radius function along the medial axis fragment uh, and the medial axis segment positions, and then see if we can basically extract uh, these cues locally or not. So uh, parallelism is the first cue, and parallelism is related to when the radius function along the medial axis remains locally constant, all right? So that gives us a notion of, um, that gives us a notion of a parallelism. The second cue we looked at was taper. Uh, imagine that we have uh, 3D uh, scenes that are projected on a 2D plane. So we, we can get uh, projected lines, uh, perspective projected lines. So the second cue we uh, uh, took into the account was basically to look at where 
the radius function along the medial axis segment, the change in the radius function stays constant. So we basically compute the derivative of the radius function and then see where the derivative of the radius function remains locally constant. The second measure uh, is related to proximity. Um, as uh, you know, the medial axis provides a distance to either side of the boundary. So we can basically know that those points that are associated with the medial axis, we can compute how far away uh, these points are from each other by, uh, co by considering the radius function alone on its own. So um, the further apart, uh, they make a bigger separation and they, as they get closer, the radius values uh, decreases and uh, we have uh, more uh, contour pixels in, in proximity. And the fourth and final measure that uh, we considered here is uh, mirror or mirror symmetry, uh, which looks at the, bend, the amount of bending on the medial axis segment. So if, uh, if we just uh, imagine that uh, medial axis is representing some sort of symmetry, if the axis alone is not bending, then we can imagine that we have a mirror symmetry property locally. So uh, the last measure that we developed basically tried to capture this. So it just captures the amount of bending along a medial axis uh, fragment. All right, so I'm just showing uh, four scenes here that are basically weighted by each of these measures. And um, yeah, like I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm going to tell you on how we can uh, use them in uh, both behavioral and uh, machine experiments. All right, so our first set of experiments is motivated by the previous work that showed that human observers benefit from perceptual grouping cues in scene recognition from contours. Now, uh, our goal was to examine whether a CNN-based system also benefit uh, from these cues. So we created splits of 50-50% of the contours, and uh, then we tested them with both uh, human subjects and also with um, um, CNNs. So now, I'm showing you the results of, um, I'm showing you the results for those experiments. So as we can see, uh, for each of those cues, uh, we see a, a, a consistent better performance over the top 50% than the bottom 50%, like for parallelism, taper, proximity, and mirror in all of the uh, behavioral experiments. But then what we did was that we took these uh, splits and then fed them to uh, a neural network, BGG16, uh, and then tested them there. Here, as our uh, data set for both RT scenes, which contained 475 images and MIT67 were small, we took a pre trained model and then fine tuned the uh, convolutional layer networks. Uh, network architecture. Uh, so we didn't like, you know, we didn't train the network from scratch and then tested uh, these uh, stimuli with, uh, with, uh, with them. So uh, what we notice is that we see that CNN based system mimics the trends we saw in human observers. We interpreted this as evidence that all four Gestalt motivated importance measures are beneficial for scene categorization in both uh, computer and human vision. All right. The next set of experiments uh, focus on how uh, we can use our importance uh, measures to improve scene categorization of line drawings. So to address this question, we carry out a second experiment where we explicitly encode importance measures for the CNN uh, by feeding them into the three channels, the R, G, and B channels. Um, uh, so this is this is how we do it. So we um, we, we we try the uh, contours, but then we replace either of these contour channels by adding another channel, which is uh, contours weighted by one of these uh, grouping cues, either symmetry, proximity, taper, or um, um, parallelism. 
All right. So here I'm showing you the result, the long laundry list of results on uh, two data sets. Uh, one is the MIT 67, and the other is the uh, places 365. Uh, and also, sorry, uh, on the artist uh, scene data sets, so three data sets. So the artist on MIT 67 are shown on the left and uh, the places is shown on the right. Now, the thing to remember here is that we are um, trying to see the improvement of the, uh, in, in the improvement we get in uh, performance uh, by adding these cues explicitly over the use of contours alone. So as we can see here, uh, by adding these cues explicitly, we always get a better, uh, you know, we always get a better performance, a boost in the performance over the use of contours alone. So, um, so that was uh, that was the interesting result of uh, what we expected to see and what we actually. Um, so, so it is apparent that these uh, perceptually motivated uh, weighted contour channels added. Uh, like there is always a consistent boost to the results. And uh, this result to me suggests that the deep neural networks such as VGG16 are not necessarily addressing these cues internally. And uh, maybe we can improve them by, uh, you know, uh, providing them these cues uh, either explicitly or like, you know, letting them compute them uh, implicitly. All right, um, so if you just, I, I just took out the best combination of the performance we get. The best combination of the per performance we got was basically contour proximity and mirror symmetry. Um, so this, this gave us the, be the best performance in all of those three uh, data, data sets. And uh, relatively the performance over the use of con contours are um, like you know are are either seven percent for the artist uh, data set, almost twelve percent for MIT six seven, and almost uh, twelve percent for places three sixty five, which is which is a big number. All right, so most of uh, of most of what I have shown so far belong to what I did uh, during my PhD. Uh, starting last year when I started my postdoc uh, at U of T, I tried to focus on a more comprehensive system of computing gestalt grouping cues, which meant uh, we needed to be aware of the other cues in junction with those that have already explored. So, uh, I talked about proximity and symmetry um, a lot, uh, but then I uh, like, you know, we, we started looking at the other cues that, um, you know, I previously listed in this presentation. So, uh, now in the continue, I'm going to focus the other two, continuation and closure. All right, so uh, let me first discuss the motivation uh, behind this work. I wanted, I, I wanted to kindly look at the uh, figure here and see if you can uh, perceive some illusory contours. Uh, most probably you can imagine the following illusory contours. So I'm just going to play them for you. I hope you have the same <laughs> illusion as me. So um, let's just like take a look at another example, the famous Kanitsa triangle. So even though uh, there are not any triangles in this image, we see two um, like we see two triangles intersecting each other, right? So uh, so this is this is what illusory contours that are produced by our brain. Uh, show us here, like, you know, we see, we see, we, we tend to see them, all right? Now, um, so uh, the question is uh, how, how this happens and how, how we can use this mechanism to basically complete uh, shape figures. So as you can see, our brain is doing some sort of perceptual grouping that tried completing figures. So this phenomena of illusory contour completion can be explained by the gestalt grouping principles of good continuation and proximity. And it has been well studied in vision, uh, you know, by vision scientists and uh, it provides a compelling example of how uh, human visual uh, you know, systems are 
you know, able to recover these um, missing fragments, missing, uh, missing segments. All right, so you may ask why shape completion? Uh, shape completion is, is very important in vision because it's, it covers a significant challenge in the field uh, that is to infer the shape of 3D structures uh, given the information that's provided by their projection on a 2D plane. Um, so, um, so that's, uh, you know, that got uh, our attention here and we tried to focus on the object completion problem, which is the problem of computing the shape and relative likelihood, um, uh, uh, the relative likelihood of the family of the curves uh, that potentially connect these uh, missing fragments and the missing, uh, missing contours. And uh, yeah, uh, so uh, I'm going to talk about this. Now, um, this is uh, kind of uh, related to some of the, uh, like, you know, some of the earlier work that uh, that's done, like, you know, by scientists in uh, like, you know, uh, during 1960s to uh, <laughs> uh, up, up to now, uh, like Hubble in 1962, uh, showed that the receptive fields of neurons in area V1 of the uh, visual cortex are uh, retinotopically organized and narrowly tuned to the stimuli of the specific position and orientation. So uh, maybe V1 is consequently mapping the space of position orientation in plane. Um, so this, 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 this is uh, like, you know, this is um, the uh, motivation behind, um, behind the continuation and closure. All right, so now let us see how we can formulate the problem. So here we revisit the original paper by Williams and Jacob on computing a stochastic completion field. So to simplify um, the, uh, like, you know, the, the terminology in the presentation, I'm going to use SCF abbreviation in place of the stochastic completion field for the rest of this presentation. Now, let us imagine that we have an incomplete circle like this. And the question is, can we uh, complete it, all right? So can we uh, make a complete circle? Now, uh, three steps uh, needs to be done here. First is we need to find points that should be connected to each other. The second step is we need to estimate the orientation at each of these uh, you know, key points, I say, that need to be connected to each other. And the third step is just to see how we can let a particle um, on this point uh, or like on this point on either of these points and let it, uh, you know, um, let it just um, do a random walk and see if it gets to the other point. And then these walks, uh, can these walks basically give us, uh, you know, uh, give us an idea of how um, the likelihood of probable path uh, that travels between this, these two key points are formed in the image space or not. All right, so I'm gonna just uh, you know, formulate the problem a little bit. So let's just say we have a point P, uh, source point P, X zero, Y zero, and uh, a particular orientation theta zero, and same point Q, X one, Y one, and a particular ending orientation Q one. Now to compute the SCF here, we borrow a model that's based on the random walks. The question is, uh, can we find all the path that starts from P and ends at uh, Q? And how all these routes will repeat in the image domain? So if you do this, then we will have a probability density uh, map for image pixels where each pixel uh, is assigned a score that says, uh, what's, the probable, uh, what's the probability of that point being on, on a path that connects P uh, to Q with those particular starting and ending uh, orientation. So the belief that this approach is the correct one is reinforced by the observation that neural activity in receptive fields can be viewed as the probability distribution of a particle's position. All right, so unlike the familiar two-dimensional isotropic a random walk where a particle's state is simply its position in the plane, the particles of random walk, uh, walks described here possess both orientation and position. So uh, we can imagine that these uh, random walks are modeled in 3D space of uh, positions and orientations. So a particle's move then 
can be formulated as simple, uh, like, you know, as, uh, as simple as uh, x dot equals cosine theta and y dot equals sine uh, theta, where theta is uh, the orientation change, uh, which is randomly sampled at each time step from a normal, um, uh, from a normal uh, uh, sampling function. So then, uh, you know, skipping a lot of math, we can just uh, say the probability of a path that goes through the point x and y with orientation theta is uh, formulated by this equation here. Uh, I'm, I'm not going to get into uh, the math details, but um, um, we can use uh, Fokker-Planck equation to solve this problem. So Fokker-Planck equation is a partial differential equation that describes the time evolution of the probability density function of the velocity of a particle under the influence of a drag uh, forces and uh, random forces as in the uh, Brownian motion. Now, using fractional computations, we can determine the necessary partial derivatives here. We can compute the likelihood of any contour being the completion path between these pairs of uh, key points. And uh, here, I am showing some example results of running the SCF with some of these key points. Remember that the key points, um, you know, are tied to their orientations too. And this is like the result of basically like we created a stimuli uh, with um, half pixels on and half pixels off, trying to see if we can, you know, recover the remaining uh, shape of the object. All right. In 1991, Bitterman and Cooper showed that the human observers are better at classifying degraded line drawings uh, when they are only shown uh, contour junctions than when they are only shown uh, the middle segments. So here, we wanted to see how the SCF algorithm would perform in a similar experiment, but this time computationally. So we tested the SCF algorithm on the Snodgrass and Wonderworld database of line drawings, which included 260 uh, object models that are uh, that were fed in um, you know in in a 256 by 256 grid. So um, all right, here I'm just showing an example of uh, completion on the degraded version of uh, you know on one object uh, from this degraded version of the data uh, you know on this data set of line drawings. So we took a vectorized uh, version of the line drawings that were manually traced. Um, and we created the two splits where in one split, we are just showing the middle segments. And in one split, we are just showing the um, junction segments. And this is the result of the running uh, of the uh, SCF algorithm. And this is uh, what we can basically extract as, uh, you know, the, the path with the highest probability. Now, now creating these, uh, these stimuli, we have uh, one stimuli where we have the middle segments and where we have one, one set of stimuli where we have the junction segments. Uh, we did the following. We uh, computed the SCF for each of these two conditions. And then if we multiplied uh, that probability maps from uh, computed SCFs with the complementary of the other half. So for example, if I wanted to see uh, how easy it is to recover uh, middle segments from junctions, I took the SCF that is produced by junctions and multiplied it by the middle segments that we had from the intact scenes and did the same for the uh, other condition. All right. And what we uh, end up getting is uh, was that uh, we noticed that it's easier to recover uh, middle segments uh, from junctions than recovering junctions from middle segment, which basically matched with the behavioral experiment of Bitterman Cooper. So, um, so in other words, the visual system had an easier time completing missile, missing middle segments. Uh, just as did the SCF. So even though we did not uh, fit our algorithm to any psychophysical uh, data, it matched the uh, human behavior. All right. So here 
I want to show you how the SDF algorithm can help us complete objects. So first we start with an image and the mask that's occluding the image. So uh, then uh, we detect the image uh, outline and trace the, um, and trace the outlines and find uh, where the outlines basically intersects with this mask. So that gives us the uh, key points that we need to um, basically fit to the SCF algorithm. So using our SCF computation algorithm, we compute the SCF probability map using the key points from the previous step. And uh, please note that the SCF uh, not only produces the probability map, but also produces uh, a vector field for us, which gives us the most probable orientation. Again, remember that those particles uh, were associated with both uh, position and orientation. So uh, we do have a vector field here. Now, using this vector field, we can find the most probable path uh, that connects these uh, key points to each other, uh, basically enabling us to uh, complete uh, the uh, missing segments. So uh, this is um, this is how uh, we we can basically uh, complete an outline for a violin uh, example that that's shown here. Now, using this completed outline, if we tried. Um, a couple of different generative models and we try to see if we can do uh, some um, shape, uh, some image completion, all right? Now I'm going to talk about it in the next slide. All right, so we try to do image in painting using this idea of uh, shape completion and figure completion. And uh, we use this figure completion as the guidance for the image in painting algorithm. So, uh, as you probably know, image and painting is a process of uh, completing the image, um, completing an image that has uh, some missing regions. Now, we see that by using the SCF, we can aid the image and painting algorithms. And uh, this is how we do it. So we first complete the contours and then uh, we feed the contours uh, additionally to the mask image to the generative model. And here we see some results uh, from the imaging painting uh, algorithm. So these are, these are two of the state-of-the-art uh, models that exist. This is our input. Uh, these are the completed contours. And uh, this is our result when we guide the algorithm uh, by completing the shape. And uh, this is another set of results. Oh, by the way, how much time do we have? Um, so it's, uh, you're, you're about up to an hour now. So probably do you have a lot more to present? I think I have like a couple of more slides, like three, yeah. four more slides. I, I, I'll be quick. Yeah, that shouldn't be a problem. Uh, all right, thank you. All right, so um, so I we covered uh, like, you know, four of these cues, proximity, symmetry, continuation, and closure. And in the last part of this uh, you know, talk, I want to talk about the uh, similarity queue. So uh, I, I'm going to just uh, show you uh, quickly, like, you know, of an idea that helped us basically use similarity to detect, um, um, to detect medial access from real images. And the intuition behind this comes from um, a work that's uh, done by Stavros, um, uh, who is a PhD, like, was a, a postdoc student by his fan and then followed up by another PhD student in his group. And I was, uh, you know, a part of this work. Now, uh, the intuition is very simple. Let's just imagine that, you know, we're looking at, uh, at an image and then we want to group these uh, similar regions to each other. Let's just imagine that I'm going to fill in uh, medial inscribed disks. All right. Now, if I fill in a me medial inscribed disk here and then compute the average of this uh, average color on the on this medial in uh, on, on this medial inscribed disk, and then compare it to the actual image, what do we see? We see that the difference between these two are very uh, small, right? But if I just you know put this medial inscribed disk somewhere that you know. Uh, contains regions with you know, not necessarily similar content, then the average 
uh, and the actual image, uh, they, 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 they would, you know, they would have a higher difference. So we use this intuition and we created an algorithm that basically helped us uh, detect symmetry uh, from uh, real images. So, um, so um, we uh, compute a measure of color homogeneity, which is based on the local histograms of image intensity. So we, we computed the tiling of the image using the six by six first. And for each tile, we compute an average intensity value per each color channel. And then we constructed a local histogram for each channel uh, by placing these averages in one of those, uh, you know, the 10 beans of the histogram we uh, designed. So this allowed us to measure up to what extent the cost for a given point and the radius of a disk uh, region, we can say uh, whether that point represents a medial, uh, you know, medial access point uh, medial inscribed disk or not. All right, so and this is uh, this is the algorithm, and this is the result um, we we see. Like you know, this is an example result that we see um, by this algorithm. All right, so uh, I want to conclude my talk here by this sentence that knowing how a structured knowledge about the world arises through visual perception and how visual features are linked to the rich details of meaning that human naturally assigned to visual information is an interesting and useful way of improving and solving many visual shape analysis problems. So, um, and here I want to thank my colleagues at McGill, uh, at U of T, at Samsung, and uh, at NYU. And also I want to thank and search for the fundings. And uh, most of what I talked about uh, is available on GitHub as open source projects. So you can check this out if, you, if you're interested in, uh, you know, in getting any of these scores. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you uh, for the interesting talk, Matissa. Um, and uh, we have time for questions. Uh, anyone would like to ask a question? Okay. Um, I will. Oh. I have. I have. Sorry, I have a question. It took forever to turn my camera on. Um, okay, so Sabur, um, in the middle of your slides, um, you talk about this um, medial, like this idea that um, medial access matters quite a bit for human behavior. But I'm just curious, like, ha like, have you compared your model to like a generic normal dot i vector model and because that because a model like that would be quite good at um extracting contours um in the scene and i think that's probably closer to um how it's done um in the brain so have you ever compared it and um if so what kind of results did you get um, uh, thank you. Um, so in, in our experiments, we actually work with, um, so let me just get back to, so uh, in our experiments, we actually work with um, a, a data set of scenes, um, which was drawn by um, professional artists. So uh, we, 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 we never tried the model uh, you, you mentioned, but uh, we actually worked with like, you know, um, drawings of scenes that were drawn by artists. And as we did have access to that, uh, we didn't like, you know, uh, we didn't try other things. So. <laughs> um. Okay, cool, no problem. Other questions? Okay, let me ask. Yeah. Oh, that's great. Please, Jeremy. Um, so I'm wondering uh, about what this does in the what what this does in the way of recovering 3D volumes out of uh, out of data. So do, does it um, can, can it tell the difference between uh, a, a a 3D and a 2D image? I suppose, or a different version of the question would be, what happens if you point this at, at, at artworks 
Does it care if the uh, if if the artwork is realistic and is describing the way objects lie in the world versus, say, a, a, a Byzantine mosaic, which would be more of a flat kind of a thing? Mm. Mm, I see. Um, it it. Uh, it, it does not care about that, uh, honestly, because uh, so what we do here is that we compute these scores uh, very locally with respect to the line drawings and boundaries that we extract. So the model itself is not aware of the um, the three D characteristics of uh, like you know what's um, uh, like the, the, the model is not aware of the 3D characteristics of the line drawing. So it doesn't have that information. It just cares about the immediate uh, neighboring points in the medial axis, um, in the medial axis transform uh, Earth shape representation. Now, this is, um, <laughs> so to me, this is, this is a shortcoming. Why is that? Like, for example, let's just say, um, uh, I, I'm gonna draw something here because I have like, you know, uh, white space. So let's just say I have a perfect square, right? Now, in a perfect square, I, I do not see the, like, you know, for example, if I want to look at the symmetry score, like, you know, at, at, like, you know what's, what makes a symmetry? I do not see like, you know, symmetry on this axis or on this axis. I see the symmetry, on this or on this, right? But the model that we design here extract the uh, medial axis transform, which takes into account the immediate neighbors according to that representation. All right. Now, is it possible to go further and, like, you know, make this a little bit more complex? Yes, it is possible because uh, the whole nature of the line drawings uh, has a quadra uh, quadratic. Um, uh, complexity, so it's it's not very complex to consider multiple line drawings, but going a little bit further uh, away, like you know, as you said, like you know, for three D, um, uh, like you know, talking about the three D characteristics, I think it's it's fairly complex, and <laughs> I haven't looked at this yet. Thanks. That's a good question. Um, other questions. I just uh, to follow up on Jeremy's question. Um, this kind of gets at the difference between local and global uh, shape and scene perception, right? And as you say, um, the medial axis transform is coding local information, um, and uh, but we know that human perception is very sensitive to global uh, shape and global scene layout. <clears throat> And maybe a good example of that is uh, actually in your stochastic completion field work. Um, this has been a raging debate for decades about whether um, you can explain illusory contours using sort of simple local um, continuation rules or whether there are more global, uh, even perhaps semantic factors that determine our percept. So, one challenge for stochastic completion fields was to explain uh, the situation you actually showed where there are missing corners, right? And, you, and your results are consistent with that. You find that uh, pervasive injunctions um, is uh, challenging for completion, right? So um, I guess the general question then is, is this really the right model for completion and for coding uh, seen information, or should we be looking more globally? Um, yeah, that that's <laughs> that's a very good question. To be honest, uh, yeah, like you know, knowing what's the right model is something that, like you know, I I scratch my head, you know, every day, trying to you know find a good answer. Um, I I think uh, the the, the use of SCF uh, basically proposes some benefits that are derived directly from uh, two of the grouping cues that we, we know, right? Like, you know, um, the uh, good continuation and closure. 
but I don't think, as you, as you mentioned, I don't think that uh, this model alone is capable of, you know, um, answering um, all the, uh, you know, is, is, is able to answer that, you know, uh, bigger question, like, you know, how, how we can complete shapes in, uh, in general, right? Like it, it, it doesn't provide a global model. It doesn't uh, consider uh, necessarily uh, the 2D characteristics of objects. So it, I think it's just, it's just suggesting some benefits to, to those um, two grouping cues. And yeah, that is right. Like, you know, um, one of the shortcomings of this model is that it's not able to recover um, corners, like, you know, singularities like that. And uh, it's, it's, it's a shortcoming. And yeah, I 100% I, I agree with you. Yeah, well, no, you know, I mean, it's hard to solve everything, right? Yeah. Um, I have one other question. Um, so uh, in your deep network uh, work, you, you fine tune the networks on contours. Mm -hmm. And um, so what you end up discovering then is, is if you fine tune them, uh, how good they are at scene recognition, right? It's also interesting to, to try to know without fine tuning, just on their regular image net training, how they make use of contours and to what extent, right? And you didn't show that, presumably because they're uh, not very discriminative for contours. In fact, they don't really have very, uh, very strong activations. Um, but one possibility is um, because you're working on uh, image completion using uh, the heat equation, right? So mm -hmm. a general question is if you just take the contours and then you run a few iterations of the heat equation, uh, first of all, it's interesting to ask, how does that affect human perception? Mm -hmm. So, because you might be aware of the corn sweet illusion, right? Where basically, humans don't really need all of the color. If you suggest the color at the boundaries, then we kind of uh, fill that in uh, nearly. Um, so, it'd be interesting to study. You know, you have a nice technique now, right? So, mm -hmm. you can use that technique to study human perception. And then the question is if you run the heat equation a few times, will that improve the? the network's ability to respond, to, to actually see it as an image and, and generate a response so you can actually um, ask these questions about sensitivity contour. Because you can, for example, do your top 50%, bottom 50%, but using your um, you know, partially completed uh, heat equation images. Yeah, that, <laughs> that's, a, that's a very, uh, that's a very, very very good question and that's like you know that's a supervisor question i say that you know guides you to the direct way so um so first of all uh yeah we didn't uh we didn't you know um train from scratch on the smaller data sets of the artists and mit67 here but one thing we did was that we actually trained uh a whole vg16 from a scratch on the contours for places data set where we had 1.8 million images. And to our surprise, uh, the performance on, on, on the RGB images uh, for the top one is 53% the state of the art. And by contours alone, we get almost like 40.32%. Uh, um, so which is, which is still a big number, I say. And uh, like still, when we add those cues, uh, we go a little bit higher, but still not at the RGB level. Now, uh, uh, for the second part of your question, yeah, that's an excellent idea. That's that's what uh, we are doing right now. Like you know, we are uh, using the diffusion equation uh, to uh, spread basically both colors and, uh, and the uh, scores. And uh, that actually gives another boost to, the, to these numbers that we see here. Um, like with, with, with just the uh, heat equation for the MIT 67, we see that 
the performance on the RGB is almost identical to the performance of the um, reconstructed images. I say, like you know, so uh, if you imagine that these 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 are these can be called reconstructed images. So um, yeah, like that's uh, that's something that we are doing right now. It's it's very interesting, <laughs> but we haven't yet you know released any of those numbers. Uh, they did like you know we haven't yet you know published any of those numbers. Okay, look forward to seeing the results. Any more questions for Rutessa? Okay, well, I just want to thank you again, Rutessa, for kicking off our seminar series. Thank um, you for giving me the opportunity. It's a good um, presentation, I think, for our group because with a mix of uh, you know uh, problems in in computational and human vision, so very very nice. Okay, um, so uh, I just want to speak to the uh, audience briefly that uh, the seminar series is continuing as usual online for the fall, um, and we'll be releasing a more complete schedule shortly, same time, same station. Um, looking forward to seeing you all there. Um, now, I think, um, now you're going to meet with the students, which is, I think, uh, yes, scheduled for three thirty. So, um, I uh, one of us. Uh, what is the schedule? Uh, let's see, Kevin, are you uh, supposed to be meeting now? Kevin just left. Oh, he left. Okay. Um, yeah. I see. So, um, We just have to make sure that you connect with the trainees. Um, okay, Shanice here, let's see. Let me see the on it. okay. Um, yeah, okay. Uh, I'm not sure who the trainees are that signed up. I wasn't given that information. Um, let's see, and I'm not the host, so I don't think I can assign another host. Participants. Mm. Well, I'll turn the recording off.